There it is. Are we on? Yeah, I'm just trying to get this on full screen.
Welcome everyone. We're going to start in about two or three minutes. We're going to let a few more people get to Facebook Live for the live streaming and then we will get started. I'm sorry, Michael. I am sorry to make myself heard, but Francoise said she just tried to join from her link and there's nothing that redirects her from the Zoom to the uh, Facebook page. She'll need so. to go to our, if she goes to our website, which is jewishchattanooga.com. Right, but there's nothing when you try to click in, if you don't already know that, there's nothing. Correct. Else. All the emails that went out this afternoon and yesterday prompted people that if they couldn't get into the Zoom, that they should go to the website to go to Facebook Live. Oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to mute myself again. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. No. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Dezik, and I'm the Executive Director of the Jewish Federation of Greater Chattanooga, one of tonight's co-sponsoring organizations. We are honored and grateful to have Art Spiegelman with us this evening to engage, to learn, and to find common ground about difficult subjects. As people of many faiths at this event tonight, we are full of questions. And although we may not have all the answers, Together, we will embark on creating a united, caring community, an open and honest dialogue, and begin taking steps towards a common cause. I know I speak for all of my friends in McMinn County, in Chattanooga, and the entire metro area by saying thank you. With over 10,000 participants tonight, from all over Tennessee, the United States, North America, to many countries in Europe and South, South America, people of many faiths and all walks of life, we truly feel your support loud and clear. And we don't take that for granted. As we begin tonight's program, I wanna thank all of our co-sponsors for your partnership and most importantly, for your friendship. Along with the Chattanooga Jewish Federation, special thanks to Pastor Jeff Krim, and Ascension Lutheran Church in Chattanooga, Rabbi Sam Rotenberg and B'nai Zion Congregation in Chattanooga, Rabbi Craig Lewis and Mizpah Congregation in Chattanooga, and the Tennessee Holler. As you know, tonight's event is being recorded and we will send the link out afterwards as well as on the Jewish Federation website and our Facebook page. All of the co-sponsor Congregations will also have the link on their websites as well. It is now my pleasure to call on Pastor Jeff Krim for a few opening remarks and introductions. Again, welcome and thank you for being with our community tonight. Hi, thank you, Michael. Um, this really started as a conversation between a few people about having a book discussion group. And it really took on new legs when I didn't really know what I was doing. And I Googled who is Art Spiegelman's agent. And um, it turned into this huge webinar that we're all just so pleased to be a part of. 
<clears throat> I have the honor this evening of introducing our two interviewers who will be uh, guiding our discussion with Art and Art himself. Our two interviewers tonight are Whitney Kimball Coe and Jackie Nodell. Whitney is the director of the national pro of, of national programs at the Center for Rural Strategies. In that role, she leads the Rural Assembly, a nationwide movement striving to build better policy and more opportunity for rural communities across the country. As an organizer, speaker, and moderator and writer, Whitney has shared her perspectives on community and civic courage with audiences around the world. She's been featured on stage at the Aspen Ideas Festival and at the inaugural Obama Foundation Summit and as a guest on the radio program On Being with Krista Tippett. <clears throat> and very importantly, she is also a resident of McMinn County and a mother of two. Jackie Nodell is a comic book historian and the author of How to Go Steady, Timeless Dating Advice, wisdom and lessons from vintage romance comics. Jackie grew up in the comic book industry and was toted to countless comic book conventions as a child by her grandfather, Matt Nodell, who created the Golden Age Green Lantern. So it's pretty obvious that Jackie would want to contribute to the comic book world herself. In addition to preserving the history of romance comics through her website, Sequen Sequential Crush, Jackie has written articles for academic encyclopedias, textbooks, and forwards and afterwards for Dark Horse and Oni Comics. She also appeared on PBS's History Detectives, and her work has been called a must read for anyone interested in American pop culture of that era. <clears throat> and now the person most of us are here to hear from, um, and who probably doesn't really need me to introduce him, Art Spiegelman. Art Spiegelman has almost single-handedly brought comic books out of the toy closet and onto the literature shelves. In 1992, he, he won the Pulitzer Prize for his masterful Holocaust narrative, Mouse, which portrayed Jews as mice and Nazis as cats. Mouse, continued, Mouse 2 continued the remarkable story of his parents' survival of the Nazi regime and their lives later in America. His comics are best known for their shifting graphic style and their formal complexity and the controversial content. In his lecture, What the Heck Happened to Comics, Spiegelman takes on audiences on a chronological tour of the evolution of comics, all while explaining the value of this medium and why it should not be ignored. Art believes that in our post-literate culture, the importance of comics is on the rise. Comics echo the way the brain works. People think in iconographic images, not holograms. And people think in bursts of language, not in paragraphs. The groundbreaking nature of Mouse continues to be testified to by the fact that in 2009, it was chosen by the Young Adult Library Association as one of its recommended titles for all students. And as recently as 2020, the New York Public Library voted Mouse, A Survivor's Tale, one of the 125 most important books of the last 125 years. So please join me in welcoming um, Jackie, Whitney, and especially Art Spiegelman this evening. Hey friends. Hey Jackie. Hi. <laughs> Hello, <There's> Art. Art. <laughs> there we are. Hi. Are. All right. So we want to start this evening um, by looking at an image of Art's family tree. And this was from uh, it appeared in MetaMouse. Um, and the reason we're looking at this. The Holocaust was um, so devastating, obviously, and this is at the center of mouse. And so we want to start with this family tree that shows Art's family 
1939, before the devastation of the Holocaust. And then the next image is after in 1945. And this is just one branch of the Spiegelman family tree, but it very well could be any European Jewish family of the time. And looking at this just helps us see the weight of what we're speaking of tonight. These were real people that were killed. Um, now, with that said, I wanna turn things over to my co-host Whitney here, and she's going to start by asking some questions to Art. Mm. Can I interrupt for one second just to give a shout yes. out? The, the branch next door is by my uh, cousin, uh, I think he's 90 plus now, Cy Spiegelman, uh, who's devoted his life to reconstructing who was where and what happened to all of those people on a much bigger family tree than this, and conceived of showing it with another uh, branch uh, those six years later. And Cy, if you're listening, mm -hmm. thank you. So thank it's you, the Cy. most powerful two panels in mouse, and it's not even in mouse directly. It's just a, a way of, as you just said, Jack, showing that these are real people. Mm -hmm. Sorry to. Mm -hmm. No, I'm glad. Thank you. Um, so this, <laughs> this is just incredible. This has been a, an intense week, several, a couple of weeks um, for those of us living in McMinn County. And also I know for you, Art Spiegelman, this has been an intense couple of weeks. Um, you've received requests for interviews and I'm sure a ton of emails. I bet your inbox is just overflowing. And, you know, I know you're, you yourself have been struggling with questions about what happened in McMinn County with our school board decision um, to remove mouse from the eighth grade ELA curriculum. Um, but in the another thing that's made this week, these weeks so intense, I think too, is just that it's sparked so many conversations from many different, in many different ways, many different dimensions. So there's the conversation about book bans and censorship and, um, and also bills that are going through state legislatures right now that are all geared toward purging offensive material um, from libraries. It sparked conversations about, um, you know, anti-Semitism that still exists in this country. Uh, we've, we're, we're definitely um, talking about that and we're talking about, you know, sanitizing history. We're talking about, um, you know, what was the intention behind this ban or this pulling the book back from um, the eighth grade curriculum? So there are just so many entry points. And since I have you, since we have you here with us today, I'm I'm curious about, you know, how would you enter this conversation? How do you, what, what door do you feel like is, is most important for the artist and the storyteller of Mouse um, to enter into as, as we're, parsing out all of this that's happened in the last two weeks. Yeah, well, the parsing has been what I what sent me into a tailspin mm -hmm. because um, I kept reading the minutes, you know, and then tried to figure out on a uh, malevolence to ignorance scale where the McMinn County Board sits. Because at first I just thought, oh, it's a joke. Uh, because to complain about these relatively mild words, they're dirty words, I agree, they're, but on, on TV I was able to say them on, a, on news reports without it being an issue. Uh, and some things that, as offensive as those parents seem to have found my book, I found the description of my dead mother's body in a bathtub where, where she had slashed her wrists, described as a nude woman. Uh, deeply troubling to me. You know, it was hard to draw. It was hard to think about. I wasn't present at the moment. She was discovered. My father came home that day before I did. Uh, but I would say a naked corpse would probably be a more intelligent use of language, just for starters. And everything about the minutes kept bringing up things like, and he, and he worked for Playboy. How can he possibly be a reliable uh, guide for kids? As if I speak the same in every situation. I don't quite, and um, 
And Playboy is a place that brought uh, Shel Silverstein's work into the world. Uh, I think many of his children's books are among the most popular, not to mention Margaret Atwood and um, Gabriel Marquez and Nabokov, and a long list that I'm very proud to be associated with, even though um, it's not like I would want to put Playboy in your school library either, especially, but um, I have no um, shame about working for Playboy and being able to work through all of those years. Mouse took 13 years to make for me. Uh, many, many layers of trying to even discover what a long comic book that needs a bookmark and asks to be reread, which is a phrase I've had in my head. Um, it was trying to discover how to even make such a thing because the word graphic story, graphic novel had sort of been around, but there were no real good demos of it. There were precursors, many, even from before comics were invented. Uh, but my goal was to make a work that wasn't meant to teach anybody anything, which confused me further because it put, yeah, you, you know, board, you should put me on the board, I'm with you. We shouldn't be teaching this to young kids. Um, and I think that the, issue is I wasn't ever thinking about it as a learning tool. I never was trying to write Auschwitz for beginners. I'm sure it's out now, but I don't think it was out when I was starting this in 1973 or something. Uh, and what I was trying to do really was to learn something myself, uh, which had to do with how, in honor of the occasion, the heck uh, did I ever get to be born, considering that both my parents were supposed to be dead before I was conceived. And in the process of that, I really had to like uh, learn a lot. I had to do a lot of uh, research, a lot of digging, a lot of questioning of my father over and over again. It actually gave us a better relationship than we'd ever had before because we were always at each other's throats as is clear in the book. Uh, and I wasn't really trying to do anything other than tell a story that felt compelling enough to devote whatever it took to make it work in order to both understand and maybe the right word is share. So I wasn't thinking about who I was going to be sharing with, you know. Uh, I was thinking of it more as if I keep it honest and keep it clear, it will do its job. And that meant finding ways to make that clarity without making it more clear than it can be. Uh, in other words, I don't want to dumb it down. And it seems to me that part of the problem for the school board, I'm, I'm assuming that this, on the malevolence ignorance scale, they're closer to ignorance, I would hope, uh, because that could be corrected. Um, it would be impossible for me to have done this book as only a historical text and extracting myself from it. Because uh, first of all, it's how I think. I, I just want to be sure you understand who's telling you what and how it's happening. But beyond that, it's what, it's what um, makes the story compelling for people, obviously, now looking back. Uh, in other words, when a book first came out and I found out I was getting a young adult fiction award, I was furious because I spent 13 years to finally make a long book that needed a bookmark and wanted to be reread uh, for adults. And now I'm being told it was fine for young adults. And it was only over a period of years that I realized, A, one can't protect kids. They know everything already. And B, that if you speak to them honestly, they know it, they can tell the difference. If I was trying to make a, a tool to uh, teach the Holocaust, uh, it start feeling medicinal. When I first found out that it was being used in curricula and in school use, it was very early on, it was right after the first volume came out that that began happening. Uh, I would have been kind of unhappy because I figured a lot of the stuff I had on my curriculum, I was bored to tears by. I think everybody in at least New York State had to read Ethan Fromm. And I'm sure they got a bunch of remaindered copies at the state level and just gave it to every junior high school kid. A uh, difficult thing to enjoy at that age. And I haven't tried to reread it. It took me a long time to even read other works of, of that ilk uh, and by that author. Um, so. I, I learned that it was okay for kids to approach this from having met the kids that read it and still do. Uh, um, I was interested to learn that until last year, till very recently, McMinn County also thought this was possible on an eighth grade reading level. And I'm distressed to find uh, that that's changed in the midst of strong political headwinds that are burning books literally in Nashville, not 
just more than a few days ago that are trying to totally readjust our curricula to terrify librarians and uh, book readers and teachers. Uh, it's a heroic job. I never wanted to be a teacher, but I did want to be a librarian. And this is just the beginning. I mean, this bookshelf. To, to I think this would be a good spot to hop in and ask our next question. So Art, as you know, you're a comic book historian yourself. Um, comic books have always been seen as suspect um, from comic strips in the newspaper because they were published on Sundays to the, the comic book burnings um, in the late 40s and early 50s that were a reaction from various um, parental groups and other groups um, that felt that certain comic books were not in the best interest of children. Um, these events uh, eventually led to the uh, Senate Judiciary uh, Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, delinquency uh, those hearings, and the Comics Code Authority. Um, do you think what happened in McMinn County is a similar displacement of adult fears and anxieties projected on things that are accessible and that resonate with young people? Or do you think it's an attempt at social control or a sanitization of history or under the guise of protecting children, or is it something else entirely? Under the guise of protecting children, and it was actually in its own weird way well-intended, because uh, as I've said when thinking about these things, there were literal co uh, comic book burnings with churches, schools, uh, and parents uh, getting the kids' comics and throwing them into the bonfires. Why you now get headlines about comics selling for a zillion dollars each uh, to be put in a plastic slab. But to me, it seems like the right formulation might be, it was a witch hunt, but they were witches. Uh, the comics were not uh, all this way, but there was a, a spectrum of them, the ones I loved the best, actually, uh, that were genuinely violent, sexist, lewd, filled with stereotypes of both the good, good and the bad characters. And it was all part of the birth pangs of a, of a medium that has now come to fruition, but it was in its early days with a, a lot of youthful energy. Most of these comics makers, like probably your father when he started, they're very young people. Uh, and it was just saying, okay, it's a gig and that's good in the depression. It's hard to get a gig, but nevertheless, it was also a place to really let the id out. And that's where it made me respond so strongly to the idiom and millions of other kids. It's important to point out maybe that this was the first medium aimed directly at kids that they could get at by themselves. 10 cents would get you there. And that's, um, mm -hmm. that's where the panic started coming in. It soon got replaced by rock and roll as the thing that was gonna bring our civilization down uh, and, not, and allowing a picture of Elvis Presley on the TV screens of early years, showing him writhing sexually. Uh, but these energies are hard to control but they also are energies because they have so much rich possibility. Rock and roll, as you can see, really did turn into an international language and culture, and so did comics, despite the attempts to suppress and censor them. So I believe this is all about parents wanting to control their kids in the guise of protecting them. And as I said, quoting actually uh, Maurice Sendak in a conversation I had with him in a two-page comic in the New Yorker that you could probably find called In the Dumps if you use your internet skills properly. Uh, he says, you can't protect kids from anything. They know it all already. Uh, ch childhood is images of cannibals vomiting in your mouth. Uh, it's it's, um, it's it's a time where the people are trying to understand things and kids more than ever, they're the most open and they're the most willing to understand. I now know this better than I did when I was suspicious of Mao's being taught. I now feel a curriculum might even be better than uh, reading it on your own if you can get past the idea that it's medicine because the curriculum even that the school board was trying to offer was, we're gonna give you supplemental materials. If you wanna find out where Krypton is, <laughs> it's the shtetl in Eastern Europe. Um, so since most of the creators or many of the creators were Jewish, so therefore, I just think it's all about control and control that 
doesn't need to be exercised. What needs to be exercised is empathy and intelligence. I agree with you more. And, you know, you, you touched on this a little bit, but do you think um, artists, we as adults, do we have a duty to young people to challenge them with material that is difficult in order to get at these conversations about subjects such as the Holocaust and to fully engage them to become productive members of our society? Yeah, I suppose that's true. Uh, the thing is to just be receptive to the kids and to help them understand whatever it is they want to understand. You know, I will annoy my um, comrades on the left as much as uh, the school board when uh, it comes to prohibiting books. What has to be done is they have to be contextualized. I wouldn't be thrilled to find out my kid was studying uh, the Turner Diaries in their uh, middle school class, but I would accept it if the, if the teachers who have to be trusted as much as the children have to be trusted, the young people have to be trusted, could actually deal with the material. What is this? Why is this uh, hateful book here? And I would point out that when I started Mao's, it was originally a three page strip in that underground comic. And it started out with me just having to make something with anthropomorphic characters, three pages long for this particular book. That was the extent of the edit. And at first I would, thought I would do a horror comic, the kind that were being burnt, Tales from the Crypt, things like that. And uh, I thought I'd just replace the humans with animals. So I was gonna have a mouse that looks completely human and has human issues until they go out their door and they get their head cut off by a, um, uh, a mouse trap at the door and be reminded that they're animals. Then I realized that's a long haul for a short slide. It's not quite worth the effort. And then I had the good fortune of being in a film class with uh, my now very good friend, uh, Ken Jacobs, an independent non-narrative mostly filmmaker, was very, very perceptive looking at film. And I wasn't a student, I was just auditing. I'd been kicked out of college already. Uh, but what happened was he was showing these racist cartoons from the period, from the 30s and things like that, these minstrel lipped uh, Jesse characters. And then he, and at the same time, he also showed uh, an early Mickey Mouse cartoon, the first sound cartoon, Steamboat Bill. And he said, look at this guy. He's uh, singing jazz. He's uh, got white face with black around it. Uh, and so he's just Al Jolson with big ears, big round ears. Uh, and because he was much hipper than he became in the 50s, 60s, and beyond being a corporate symbol. Uh, and that's when for a minute I was like, I've got it. I'm going to do a comic strip about uh, uh, black mice, and maybe they're attacked by the Ku Klux cats. Uh, and that was the notion. And in 24 hours, I started just um, <laughs> coming down and going, I don't know enough about this. I've done mock racist comics before. This will just be accused of being more of that. That was in the attempt of detoxing by showing. Uh, that was a lot of what the underground comics were about. Uh, and then I realized there's a, a metaphor far closer to home. It's in uh, Kafka, the singer of the map, or the mouse folk about something that's best read as a song about a woman singing her sad, a uh, woman mouse singing her sad plaintive song to the fellow mice about what happens to them. And also by uh, the Nazi propaganda I was becoming aware of as I read about this to know that in the film, The Eternal Jew, they cut literally from uh, Jews trapped in a ghetto, saying Jews filthy swarming in a ghetto, uh, just like rats. And then they show the rats swarming as the next cut. So this metaphor was made with my collaborator, Adolf Hitler, uh, who gave me the way in to understanding how to use this and use it in a way that I think has been very helpful in the book. It wouldn't have been the same without it. It couldn't have been the same without me making the present known. I'm sorry to speak so long without a question, but one last thing I want to point out, maybe now rather than ever else time, because it's so basic, which is uh, the Faulkner quote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. So to say, I like the part that, that happened in the past. I love the Holocaust, said one of the school board members in the minutes. Um, and that part of the book was good, but the ending was so stupid. And what do we need all this stuff about uh, my father's uh, doings before the war, how I get along with my dad would, by implication, and it's because it's a continuum. It's the, the past, 
his presence. And it's made very visible in comics. It's one of the pleasures of the medium that you have a past, a present, and a future on every page of a comic. If you look to your left from the panel you were looking at, you're back in the past. If you look to the right, you're visually in the future. And I've used Mal's in a way to make that a thorough melange because my household was a, a suburb of Auschwitz. So, and that's a really good it is uh, a segue. So Whitney um, is going to show you some of those images from Mal. Yeah, I, I mean, I just going back to something you said about how important it is to accompany our kids through some of these conversations and that, you know, in, in a way, pulling mouse from the curriculum is an abdication of that accompaniment that they need um, as they engage this material. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to, sh to share with us these images um, that the school board in particular found objectionable um, and also invite you to, to help us contextualize and explain in a way how they advance um, that story and, uh, and the storytelling. So I wonder if we could pull those up. Um, thank you. Can you see the screen okay, Art? Oh yeah, this is yeah. ideal. Perfect. Um, so one of the things that was really upsetting to the school board and gave me an, uh, what's his name, Cochran? Mike Cochran? I don't remember his name, but Mike. he wrote a uh, after saying he wasn't speaking to the school board, but then proceeded to speak to the school board that said, uh, what do we need to know about uh, these premarital affairs? It's all sexualized. This is about the extent of the sexualization in the backstory, but the story is really important to tell. It's in the first chapter, not because I'm, I'm telling tales on my father, evidently, although he was a little coy about how he said it, um, was having a premarital affair before he met Anja, my mother. And it's in that place where he starts telling me, then he goes back to fill in some more details. And then he goes on to say, but this, I don't really want to tell. Uh, I can tell you other stories, but this maybe it's not so proper, something like that. Uh, in fact, can you give me the page where, oh, the page number four, the one right above it? Yeah, that's where he says, um, this is what I told you about Lusha, and so I don't want you should write this in your book. What? Why not? It has nothing to do with Hitler, with the Holocaust. But Pop, it's great material, I say, objectifying him. It makes everything more real, more human. I want to tell your story the way it really happened, but this isn't so proper, so respectful. I can tell you other stories, but such private things I don't want you should mention. Okay, okay, I promise. Now, why is that there? Is that just be me, me being uh, a shit? Uh, no, what it is is me making a contract. My contract is not with my father. My contract is with the reader, with making a story that's lucid. Uh, and that means uh, my trust has to be earned. I have to show you that, I, and, and I was, trying to keep it as clear as I could, but no clearer. As a friend of mine, Lawrence Weschler, put it when writing about Mouse, that's what made us friends. Um, he said, uh, Mao's achieves a kind of crystalline ambiguity to push it as far as you can go without pushing it into being. And so never again, children, uh, that kind of thing. What is true here is I don't think there's anything about this that makes it anything other than a more clear gateway into the past present movements of how Auschwitz lived in my household and continues to live in my head who never experienced it as a second generation person. And doing this was a way of me finding out I was breaking not only the taboo of doing serious stuff in comics or uh, using a, a curse word or something, but the taboo of not honoring my father and mother. And that's where the school board was totally focused. All the dirty words are really, which are words like goddamn for the most part. Um, all those words are in my fraught relationship with Vladek, who I just never had a clear connection with. It was just, it was not a generation gap, but a generation chasm from a shtetl in Poland before World War II and Auschwitz to me growing up with mad comics and television. And it was a difficult and painful home life for him and for me. And that had to be expressed. And I wasn't trying to make myself any better than I am. I act like a real jerk toward my father. And that was part of what's being told. And I think that's where we get back to the McMinn County thing yet again, because what they're upset about really is that. It's my relationship with my father and that I'm not being respectful because you know one of those commandments is one must honor thy father and thy moms of liberty. 
Mom spoiled liberty, sorry, didn't mean to misstate it. Um, and therefore, I think that's where they focused. It's like, they're gonna learn something bad. No, they're gonna learn things that are about lives that probably relate to their own because one identifies with uh, mm -hmm. people in here because they feel real. That's right, they're gonna learn about this, this human, that's gonna humanize um, their experience. Um, were there- Real, more human. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I, I think that there are several strategies that were not meant to be didactic. Like at first I just agreed with the school board, yeah, teach it in college or when you're retired, but don't teach it to children or don't let anybody see how bad things can be. Uh, that school board member also suggested that we, we, what we need is a book that shows uh, the patriotism we can proudly feel for having liberated the Jews from the camps. It's a much more complex story than that. And if they're willing to tell the complex story, I'd be glad to help <laughs> make it, you know, uh, because, wow, our resistance to getting into the war and helping the Jews in the camps was great in, at the top level of government, even one of our best presidents, FDR. Uh, the uh, liberation of Auschwitz was by the Russians rather than the Americans, incidentally. Um, so, Ah, telling the truth is difficult. It took this thorny path, but I don't mind another book being used. I don't, the, the very shrewd marketers on the school board have made up for any loss of sales and books to the <laughs> classrooms. And uh, I was doing fine without that publicity. It, it's over a period of decades, it's uh, been very well received and it stays in print. And I'm grateful for it just as it was. I would much rather not have had all this have to happen. Uh, but now that it's happened, feel free to use any book. I don't recommend The Boy in the Striped Pajamas as a movie or a book. The guy didn't do any research whatsoever. Um, but there are other books. When I did the book, it was an anomaly. Now it's a genre. That's just mm -hmm. the past 40 years. Can we look at the... Did, oh, sorry, did you want to look at another image? Well, yeah, because it... Okay. it directly to this one. I think what I want is the one, yeah, the one right above it, good. Uh, this is one of the other places where I was really called to uh, taken to task. So it's the one of uh, the, oh no, I'm sorry, the one past that, the one number six instead of number five, we'll, we'll go back to that. Um, here, it's the other thing that really upset the board and got them to uh, really kind of, in a, to me, very painful way call me to task for calling my mother a bitch. Or a B blank, 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 as even the teachers were suggesting as a compromise. Can we teach it if we get rid of the, of the dirty words? Well, they were just gonna leave it as a B. Uh, so I thought if it was just gonna be left as a B, we could replace it with bagel or blint <laughs> because uh, that way we'd learn some wholesome Jewish culture and in the back we could have recipes. <laughs> I did that very knowingly and it was meant to be shocking because I was shocked. I was being uh, held accountable by my parents, fam my family and friends, very small family, but my parents, family and friends as having been responsible for this. And I'm trying to like, as I'm sitting there and this was done only after, um, four years after the event, and I'd mainly suppressed it. I knew my mother committed suicide, but hadn't allowed myself to think about it afterwards. And as it came back in a hammer blow, I just wrote it all down and said, I'm gonna stop whatever else I'm working on and make this trip happen. And that's when I, I was able to, this is, these are basically the thoughts I had. Uh, menopausal depression, and that's top center panel. Hitler did it. Mommy with me as a little kid being read to by my mother, wearing my little, concentration camp pajamas and bitch as she cuts her wrists open. That anger was there and it's why I had to shut everything down. Uh, because when she came asking for love from me and I was still resentful about something that was happening in our household, it just left me imprisoned in that moment for years. Uh, so I wouldn't describe that panel above the words men menopausal depression as a nude woman. And to see it that way is kind of nuts. Uh, this is about as vulnerable as a person can be. Uh, so maybe naked yeah. would be a word that you have to call it to account at all. But for me, it's, it's part of uh, me making something that puts me in an I-thou relationship with the reader. I'm being as open about my thoughts as possible. They're not sanitized, they're not simplified. 
and I'm proud of that. Mm. Uh, can we look at the one we passed over because that has a point that's worth making as well. Uh, this was another thing where one of the board members blurted out how horrible it was to see hanged mice and uh, children being killed. And he wasn't supposed to go there because the whole idea was to keep this rhetoric in terms of something not age appropriate. As of a 1982 decision on uh, what things can be banned, it has to do with redeeming social value and it also has to do with not banning it because of its content. Important point, this is still the law of the land, believe it or not. Um, and therefore it was supposed to focus on the lascivious picture of my mother in a bathtub and the words goddamn and bitch. Uh, so here I would point out another way in which the book has been very uh, carefully engineered to do now what I see as, oh yeah, maybe I was being didactic. I just had no idea that that was the process. This picture of hanged mice, that's a dominant picture, so you'll see it and remember it, is not drawn the way those comic books would have drawn a lynching, which I'm sure is in many of the horror and crime comics in the uh, 40s and 50s that Jack was talking about. This is a, pr a pretty generic image because comics tend to be diagrammatic. And that led me to using these mouse masks because a mouse mask, I don't have to know what every pole looked like, what all of my father's friends and family looked like, what a uh, passing uh, Nazi looked like. They're, they all had the same head basically. And in this page where my stepfather, no, my father's, my, my, my father-in-law, my, my grandfather-in-law, I guess is the right phrase, is coming back shaken because he's just seen this. And these are people who had been working in the black market and had been hanged as an example to others. So in the second row, you just see that head, that triangular head that's almost everybody's head. And it's sort of traversing the two bodies below it. He's both, at least two of those mice just by, if you look down past the panel border, you'll see the two suspended bodies and above it, this stricken face of uh, my, father's, uh, my, mo my mother's father. Uh, but below that, there's a footnote on the page that tells you who these people were. Uh, Cohen had a dry goods store. He was known all over Sosnoviets. Often he gave me cloth with no coupons, said my mother's father. And then the other people are also noted as people. And that blank face allows them to become more like people rather than less because of what I said before, of wanting to do something about blacks. It's still built into the DNA of this book. This is about oppression and turning people into less than people. And everything about the book is about making everybody three-dimensional with my two-dimensional pictures. Hmm. Thank you for taking the time to share some of that with us. Do, um, Jackie, did you wanna follow up? I know we've um, got student questions too. Yeah, are, I just wanna answer. ask yeah. quickly, um, what do you have to say to the teachers that do want to teach mouse? The individual teachers across our country? Uh, my condolences, because I'm afraid what you're heading to is uh, something to make your job insufferably worse than it has been. There are laws all over America right now in many states to have surveillance cameras in classrooms to uh, so we can monitor what teachers teach, to uh, inspect every book that's taught, every sentence that's given, so that one gives equal time. In Texas, absurdly, in one conversation, it was, well, if you teach the Holocaust, you have to teach both sides. This is like there were good people on both sides or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of were people who just got dragged into it, but that's not where the story really is. So to have to watch your words so that you don't offend somebody who might be unhappy about their grandfather being a Klansman, uh, who might be unhappy at being embarrassed by some of the things America has done in its uh, history uh, and making them uncomfortable is probably necessary. I'm grateful the teachers are willing to take it on. I think that's what the two people at those, in the minutes, the two people representing the curriculum said, this is key to a curriculum that also in its earlier stage will cover food probably and lack of same uh, for people. And uh, a last part after that, which would be about the Japanese internment camps. It's a very sophisticated curriculum and they needed Mao's in there partially because of its graphic nature, because the children need to learn how to be graphically literate as well as verbally literate. It's bombarding them at least as much 
or more than the language that's written that they're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were able to take it on is just one example of how noble these teachers are for so ridiculously small salaries. Uh, and to make that job more hobbled so they all flee to jobs as waitresses and waiters because it's better paid um, is tragic. And that's where we're headed and the school board decision is helping that happen. Uh, even if they say they're willing to teach the Holocaust, they want a fuzzier, warmer, gentler Holocaust that shows how great the Americans were when coming in to, to liberate. My father at the end of the war said, we weren't liberated, the war ended. Uh, and that's something to bear in mind. And his affection for the uh, American GIs that he was with is clear in that part of the book. And I should say that's in the second book, not in the first book. It was always meant to be one book. It got separated before birth after an article appeared in the Times saying how important this thing, this work in progress, a comic and a small publication was. And all of a sudden, since it was already contracted to a publisher who got it on a second submission after rejecting it the first time, um, they said, you know, let's publish the first part now because uh, it's done. And then that's how it became a school book. I'm not sure I would teach the second part to kids eight to 12 myself. It's, uh, it was hard for me to begin the second part of the book because it was one thing to see life in absolute extremis, but the idea of life in a death camp was an oxymoron I couldn't wrap my brain around. So uh, mm -hmm. depends on how long you have in the semester to teach the work. I think preparing people with the young people with the first book enables them to enter armed into the second book, but um, it's not in any case ever more lurid than it needs to be. Could I show that one last picture that I saw on the uh, one where um, yeah, that one. No, no, that one, yes. Um, this is one of the problems is showing what happened to kids, right? So my father literally is in the ghetto. They're all hiding from a roundup where they're taking people out of the ghetto and into the camps and describes how the Germans grabbed the kids who were screaming and wouldn't stop. Uh, a Ger Ger Germans swinged them by the legs against the wall and they never anymore screamed. In this way, the Germans treated the little ones what still had survived a little. So I want you to look at this picture to see that that picture on the lower left is a diagram of swinging and most of it is, most of the impact is literally off screen to make you look harder. It's like looking at these blank faces. It's not to rub your nose in the grand guignol thrill kicks of some sadomasochistic crazy person looking at this. And then in the next panel, it's covered up by a balloon that said, this I didn't see with my own eyes, but somebody the next day told me, and I said, thank God with Persis, um, a relative, our children are safe. Uh, so. He's covering up what he didn't see with a balloon saying he didn't see it. It's a way of not censoring it the way some people were thinking about censoring mouse on that school board of whiting out the panels, but trusting that the way I did this was not to make it as lurid as possible, but to make what actually happened as clear as possible. And comics are great for that. Hmm. All right, I have one more question. I just want to put to you as a resident of McMinn County and as a member of um, a, a large part of the community that is really wanting to build, a, you know, more inclusive and more compassionate, more informed um, community, and you know, and we're approaching it in a lot of different ways, and nobody has all the answers. But I have a feeling that a book like Mouse can help orient us toward that destination of being a more human, compassionate, just community. And I wonder if you have thoughts about the role that mouse or just art and story play in helping keeping us oriented. I understand things. That mouse, absolutely, because it's, it's how we understand things. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I think that comics might be more useful than certain books, which maybe in quotes, harder to read, uh, but also because it uh, you can go back to it. Thing about a book with prose or with pictures that are standing still is you can re enter it and like analyze it and reread and focus on it. Movies go by like you're in a roller coaster scene. And as a result, it often just gives you the adrenaline rush, the laugh, or the, or the shriek, but it doesn't necessarily give you a chance to understand what you saw. And it's brave to teach these things and necessary. It's not 
it's, it's certainly about Jews, but it's not just about Jews. This is about othering. And what's going on now is about controlling, controlling what kids can look at, what kids can read, what kids can see in a way that makes them less able to think, not more. And it takes the form of the criticisms from this board where they say he shouldn't be talking to his parents like that when they say uh, they shouldn't, he shouldn't call his mother a bad name. This is about control, controlling one's authority as a parent, thinking you're better informed on how to teach than somebody with several master's degrees who's thought, who've thought carefully about what they're teaching and how to teach it. And it's the arrogance that comes of wanting to say, I wanna have authority here because authoritarians like authority and they wanna be able to make sure that it's always present and it's in their hands. And that's a lot of what we're seeing as schools get privatized and put into charter schools that are run by churches and so on. It's not a good way for these kids to be um, able to survive in a future that's all too possible again. Um, so the advice I would have to teachers is to do your darndest. We have to protect you by giving you more money to teach, to giving you more freedom to teach, to learn to trust you as you have to trust the kids in order to be a good educator. And what you guys are doing, I'm so impressed that you're willing to have these conversations and dialogues with me because I would have fled Tennessee <laughs> very early on uh, based on how uh, difficult it is to um, make what you wanna have happen happen, to build bridges where you really have to go past your limits to get to the other side of a bridge like that. Mm. Well, this is part of that work, I gotta say, Art, this build, building bridges has resulted in a way that we have you here and Jackie and me, and it's just, it's a really nourishing moment. So thank you. Um, Jackie, you wanna close us out and take us to the next? Yeah. Um... So if we could look at that last image, um, this was a, once it gets pulled up here, um, it was a, a lithograph that you created in um, 1991 uh, called The Past Hangs Over Our Future. And this is just such a powerful image that shows how history is always looming over us. Um, I think I've read so many articles about this whole debacle and um, some people think that this whole situation has been blown out of proportion. Um, but I think what this image really shows us is that history has a way of creeping in and always being with us if we aren't careful. Um, and Mouse really forces us to bear witness um, to the atrocities of the Holocaust. And also now it's getting us to talk about all these issues that are going on in society right now. Um, but we just wanted to end with that because it's such a powerful image. Um, and we really just wanna thank you so much Art for speaking with us, um, Whitney and I, um, just have enjoyed meeting you so much. And now we would like to go to questions um, from, we have some student questions and other community questions. Um, and um, Reverend Claire Brown will be taking us through those questions. So thank you so much, Art. I want to thank you too as well. It's been inspiring. It's made me a better person. Thanks. Me too. Thank, thank you. Me too. <laughs> Thank you so much. See you. Well, Art, thank you again so much for this beautiful conversation and for being with us this evening. Um, as I was introduced, my name is the Reverend Claire Brown. And for those who are joining us this evening, um, I'm a clergy person in McMinn County serving St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And also for those who are with us this evening, I want to share with them that it was your request, Art, that we engage directly with questions from the students in our community, these young people who are coming up and learning in our school system. And you've talked so much this evening about humanizing people and trusting people. And I wanna say how much I appreciate that you're humanizing the young people in this community who are at the heart of this conversation about literature and ethics and education. 
by empowering their learning. So thank you. Um, earlier, you were speaking about trusting teachers in classrooms to handle and contextualize complicated books. And one student, Hannah, asked, when books are being banned, how can we trust that what we are being taught in schools is the truth? Oh, my dear, you can't. That's why you have to learn how to read, how to think, and how to contextualize on your own. I think schools, even when they're teaching you something poisonous, like uh, that story that came out a few days ago about uh, a girl in a Bible class that was supposed to be a secular uh, study of the literature and the history of the Bible, ends up with a teacher saying, if you ever want to torture a Jew, you have to like make him say the word Jehovah out loud. Uh, so you can't trust that teacher, but you can trust the process that takes place with some bum teachers, some amazingly uh, brave teachers, uh, because the end goal is to allow you to discover it yourself. And as we've seen, banned books are the books to seek out first. Uh, as uh, I said in a bookmark for Banned Book Week uh, a few years ago for libraries, keep your nose in a book and keep other people's noses out of which books you choose to stick your nose into. Uh, so it's, there's no easy fix. You're not going to find uh, a series of um, perfect gurus and teachers. You're going to find people that you have to like judge for yourself. And that's where it really comes in for yourself, for yourself, for yourself, not allow others to make those decisions for you, to control what you think and see and to recontextualize it out of any relationship to reality. And it has to do with reading more, not reading less. Mm, fantastic. And that's a good segue to another question. Um, this is from an anonymous student who asked, why do you think people are afraid of your book? And what kind of stories, what narratives are people afraid of and why? Okay, I mean, I mostly have met people who are not afraid of the book. So I have to now extrapolate. That's why I was reading these minutes so closely to find out what are they thinking? Um, but I think the fear has to do with, uh, this is a dangerous world. It's getting more dangerous. Are you going to try to confront it in a way that's useful or to hide your head in myths and uh, stories that uh, are heartwarming? There's a lot of stories in the Old and New Testament that are less than heartwarming and wholesome. Even that can be a useful tool, as I think from having just met you now uh, is the way you try to use whatever texts you're using. But the danger is that if you don't know what happened and don't pick up from it, uh, it's not that history exactly repeats itself. It's just you have to be instructed by what happens in the past to protect yourself from what can happen in the future. For instance, after there's been a genocide on the scale of uh, the Holocaust, it's now out of the bag. This can be done. This could even be inspiring for some horrible monster of a politician. Um, and to be to have that, I don't think it's the dirty words that are really scaring them, you know, because when they when I read that, it was more like pretend you see your loved one on the other side of a cliff or a bridge that you can't get to, and some horrible uh, maniac psycho killer is there tightening their hands around the neck. And your response is, did you see that? those fingernails, that they're, they're dirty. Uh, it's just sort of how, somehow missing what you have to try to pick up and get what's actually nourishing. And it almost always means take what you can use and let the rest just spit it out. Fantastic. Good food for thought for these young folks. Um, another question from Hannah that I think fits into the idea that uh, you're expressing here that to understand that the Holocaust happened means that it is possible. She was curious, how do you see the effect of anti-Semitism in your life and work today? Good for business. I'm kidding. Uh, I think you know that. Uh, but I, I think that it, it affects me because it's been with me all my life. You know, I've been aware of it. You know, I couldn't not be aware of it. My father always tells me to keep my bags packed when I'm a kid, you know? Like, uh, you might have to leave, this is not permanent. Everything you have is borrowed. And it's true for all of us all the time because 
we end up checking out, other people are here, and we leave whatever we leave behind. Um, so I can't quite give you a summation, but I can tell you that it's what informed that book, it's what's haunted me before and since that book. And um, on the other hand, I've also been very lucky. I found uh, and helped create a, a wonderful small family around myself and friends who were like family with me. And most of them share my trepidations. All of them share my trepidations. I haven't been to one Thanksgiving dinner where I had to deal with crazy Uncle George or something, you know, like, uh, it's a, a group of people who I can feel supported by and makes it a lot easier to be climbing around the labyrinths and uh, monsters inside my own head. Yeah, it's about people in relationships, not an abstraction of that concept. Yeah. yeah. So your relationship with your father is really the center of this story. Um, one student was wondering if there was anything else about what your father was like that you could share that maybe we didn't see in the book or something that you've come to understand about him as time has passed? Well, I've got to say that now that my father is dead, I have a much better relationship with him. Uh, it was really thorny. Uh, and I can't remember, except in looking at childhood photos, baby photos, where I'm looking up adoringly at him, sitting on his shoulders at the beach uh, as we're walking into the water. Um, and very little once I was reaching the age that um, many of these students were, are now being prohibited in, in county, uh, there I was always trying to find a way to do it and not having that much luck at it. It just was, we both wanted to reconcile. I mean, he was as pained by this as I was, but it was very hard to find those moments. I remember one time he decided we were gonna play ball together. So he took a baseball and went out into the street. He didn't know what baseball was. And I always just tried to avoid it because I was terrible at baseball, which is why I hid out in libraries all the time and considered being a librarian eventually because that was a safety zone. I just had to get away before they were choosing up sides for baseball. And then we were doing it in the street and some Catholic kids across the street, the street was half Irish Catholic and half Jewish pretty much. Um, and they were just having a laugh riot watching us even try to throw a ball back and forth. Uh, but at least I felt in solidarity, our, our uh, humiliation was shared. And that was actually somehow a cozy moment, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, Clinton wanted to know how many languages did your father speak and how did knowing them help him? Oh boy. Well, let's see, he grew up speaking Yiddish. He very quickly learned Polish because it was a small community within a, a town. Mm -hmm. uh, then he had to learn German way before World War II, but he was, he was born in 1907, I think. Um, but he learned German because his part of Poland was right next to the border with Germany. And so in some, certain parts of history, his town was called Germany, and <laughs> other places it was called Poland, and other times probably Russia. Uh, it was just, as uh, King Ubu once said, if it wasn't for Poland, there wouldn't be any Poles. Uh, so it kept coming in and out of focus. He had to learn all those languages around him. He wanted to learn English uncannily enough because he wanted to leave Poland and come to America. It was his dream. It was still that uh, the streets of America are paved with gold, I suppose. Uh, but as a result, he really knew it. And as is told in the second part of Mouse, it saved his life. Uh, in the second book, there's a Polish capo looking for uh, somebody to teach him English because the war wasn't going that well. And if the Americans should come to the camp, he wants to be able to speak to them, it would make his situation better. So my father was kept from the worst of things near the beginning by having privileges that came with being a tutor for this uh, Polish prisoner. Uh, and then when he got to Sweden, he was speaking sp Swedish. He just like, once you start, I hear that after you've got three, it's easier to get the next 12. I'm only stuck with 1.5, um, speak a little French. But um, the only words of Swedish I know, and that's somehow in retrospect, a, a, a happy moment. They tried to terrify me when we were on the beach. Same photo of my father with me. I would go running into the water, but I didn't know how to swim. And they just couldn't stop me from this either suicidal or, uh, megalomaniacal impulse that I would just float to the top no matter what. But um, 
the phrase that they used was something like stura fiskin va'ita day. And that became a family phrase after that. It meant something like a big fish is going to eat you. <laughs> so it's one way to teach, which is to terrify somebody, I suppose. Um, and then my father, when he was in America, of course, uh, kept all those languages more or less intact. Around the house, it was Polish. So I learned a tiny bit of secondary Polish mm -hmm. uh, uh, because when they didn't want me to know that we were going to go over to visit a friend of theirs whose house was really boring for me, they would tell each other, talk about it in Polish, and I had to learn enough to like, find a reason to not go with them, for example. Uh, but um, I think it helped my father because if nothing else, it forced him into another thought pattern than the one he was born with. Mm -hmm. It would have been a disaster to only know Yiddish, although he could speak to other people in those situations. The uh, <laughs> kind of code language for Jews. Uh, and in the book, you can hear one, you can see one sequence in which he sees somebody following him. And uh, he's afraid that it might be somebody about to pull him out of his hidden presence on this dark street, uh, who would mean him harm. And the other person says, I'm who, or I'm ha, I'm not, I'm not good at Yiddish, but it meant uh, one of the people and saying it in Yiddish was enough for him to relax and be able to exchange information with that person on the streets of Poland. I think it, it allows one, I wish I was better at it and had done more like scrupulous learning of other languages uh, because it gives you literally another way to think. Uh, mm -hmm. Being with Francoise and my kids, I was growing up as uh, uh, a t at a table where we both wanted them to be bilingual, my kids, the kids. And so table talk would always be in, in French. And I would, I can follow for a while and then I'd get exhausted after 15 minutes and couldn't. So then I would just go, qua, which means what? Qua, qua. So my kids did not know I was a mouse. They thought I was a duck. Just qua, qua, qua. And trying to catch up with uh, my smart little babies. Mm. Oh, I love that. Just like you encouraged our students to keep reading and read for yourself. Um, learning new ways to speak and listen, even at its heart. Yeah. One last question for you from our students. Atasia asked, how would you describe the emotional impact in your life of sharing this story? And maybe we should even clarify that as uh, before the last week and a half and since. <laughs> well, Okay, so I'll take the, the second part second, but um, I would say the book changed my life. For one thing, uh, it became very successful. I thought that Francoise and I would publish it out of this loft that you're seeing the corner of, because uh, she had made us get a printing press there. She had learned to print because she liked books. So she wants to be able to, I thought become an editor or publisher, but at first it was, how, do, how can I make books, make, make publish things myself? And in that, situation. I was working as an underground comic. I was working making things that probably won't and shouldn't be taught in school, working for a bubblegum company to make ends meet. Uh, and uh, Mao's was something we assumed we'd have to publish ourself, ourselves because it had been rejected from every publisher it had been sent to. Uh, as I said, like publish, a publisher came around on a second submission from the art director who knew me and brought it herself to some other editors up there who were more sympathetic. Um, but once it was out, it was like, for good and for ill, I was just in a different situation. For ill because ever since I've been trying to outrun that 500 pound mouse, I've even drawn it that way, chasing me. In a strip I did called Mein Kampf for the New York Times on memoir. Because nothing I can do will be like that. Mostly I've worked on and continue to work on relatively short pieces, one page, eight pages, but uh, not 300. Uh, it was a formal experiment to see if I could make such a thing. And one of the other things that concerns me is I have a few comics friends who are obsessed with certain subjects and they go back to them over and over and over again. Uh, a great artist named Charles Burns who we published in the Comics Avant-Garde magazine we did called Draw keeps going back to fear of one's own body uh, uh, where there's a, mo uh, a sexually transmitted disease that creates monsters uh, next begin, begin to spout mouths and things like that. And each person has a different 
response. And he keeps going back to other versions of that story of in many different books, because in some ways he never got to the core of what created that fear to begin with, at least in public. And I, I never heard it from all of the friends. Uh, and I think the problem with Mao's is I dived into the heart of darkness and I got it right. And getting it right makes it much harder to do anything else. So I've been continually finding places where I can stand without getting in the way of the Mao's books and trying to not get swallowed up by the 500 pound mouse who always wants to bring me in public uh, and talk about Mao's again. I've lent myself to it here, second part, because these are perilous times. This is a very dangerous moment in America. We've seen that once you've got a model for how this works, it can only get worse. And to see the growth in book banning, the growth in, in hatred for the other, because it's useful to have an other you can look down on. It goes back to how blacks got treated here from the time they got here, to what happened to American Indians, whether you like that being taught or not, Mr. McMinn County. Um, it's really fundamental to what's happening now. And it means that one can kind of see an echo from the past and uh, harbingers of doom in the future. We have much bigger problems than uh, the ones that are being faced in, uh, by the school board that have to do with not having air to breathe, not having people who can uh, eat. And it's not just in America, it's international. Uh, so in the future, I now feel I have to be a better citizen than I was, which is I'm grateful to you, Claire, and to Jack, and to Whitney, to learn me a bit about how to uh, do my duty without flinching. Um, well, thank you. You uh, wrapped up your previous conversation with Whitney and Jackie with a, a word of encouragement to teachers. I wonder if you have uh, a different or complimentary last word to offer the teenagers here in McMinn County or, or students anywhere who might have had their attention turned to Holocaust studies in your work. And you're asking what, what words of inspiration can I give them? Yeah, what do you yeah. have to say to the teenagers? Okay. All of these old bullies who are pushing you around, you're going to die. And you're going to be here and you're going to have to figure it out. And you, you, you know, you really might when you start seeing like a 13 year old girl who's gotten the world's attention, uh, Scandinavia to just focus you on how urgent climate change is. It's not a matter of making more money or less money. It's a matter of breathing. Uh, she's amazing. And there are many amazing people expressing themselves, doing it in a way that resists. And resist is a really important word here. Uh, so resist these, these forces. And actually, in some cases, I see it happening in news reports that aren't the front page, but there are examples of doing just that, of even showing solidarity. I'm really knocked out by people I, I don't need them to do it. It's not going to affect my income. I'm doing fine. But sending copies of Mao's everywhere to make sure that it's available in libraries to the point where the McMinn County Library says, please send other books or money. We're drowning in mice, <laughs> you know? And uh, the gesture though was really an important one. It makes it clear that, uh, you know, school board, you need to learn. It's, uh, this is proof that your opinions are hardly universal, that your attitudes need rethinking more than your kids do. Mm. Well, I, think I, I may be veered away and back into preaching, but kids, you can get there if you keep working at it. And if you can't, we'll find out if there is an afterlife after all. Oh, goodness. Yes. Resist. Keep thinking. Keep working on it. Thank you so much, um, Art. This was just a wonderful time to hear from you. And we are so thankful again that you would have this conversation with McMinn County um, and, and keep building bridges. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Well, now I want to welcome um, a new friend uh, in this last couple of weeks, Rabbi Sam Rotenberg, who's the senior rabbi at B'nai Zion Congregation in Chattanooga, Tennessee, who is going to conclude our evening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I have the pleasure of closing out our, our conversation tonight. Um, Hold on. Okay, first of all, thank you um, to everybody who joined us tonight, to the over 10,000 registrants who showed us that this is a conversation that we really needed to have. Um, thank you so much to everybody who put this program together, first and foremost, to Art for supporting our local community here in Tennessee by graciously agreeing to have this conversation. 
Thank you to Michael Dezik, Pastor Jeff Krim, Rabbi Craig Lewis, Jackie Nodell, Whitney Kimball Co., Reverend Claire Brown, Michiko Clark, Stephen Barclay, and to our sponsoring organizations, the Jewish Federation of Greater Chattanooga, Ascension Lutheran Church, Mizpah Congregation, B'nai Zion Congregation, and the Tennessee Holler. If you've been inspired by tonight's program, we invite you to take that inspiration and be a force for positive change in your local communities. Seek dialogue between different faith communities to foster peace and mutual understanding. Donate to your local library, reach out to your local public schools to see if they need resources or volunteers. Because as we have learned today, our teachers need support because uh, to quote a substitution that Art suggested earlier, teaching the truth can be a real blintz. You can find a recording of this program by going to the Jewish Federation of Greater Chattanooga's Facebook page or visiting the websites of the sponsoring organizations in the coming days. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.